Hey guys, <clears throat> so for this video we're going to be talking about evolution. We're just going to be diving into some of the basics of it here. Um, we're first going to talk a little bit about Darwin, uh, who was pretty important in terms of developing the theory. And then we're going to look at the different evidences for evolution. Okay, so this one won't be quite as long, and there won't be too much to go into huge depth in terms of explaining things, kind of like with the genetics, but there is still some interesting things just to kind of talk about here. So first thing is Darwin. Okay? You've probably heard of him, uh, but just more a little bit about him. He was a naturalist and geologist, and he contributed a lot to the evolutionary theory. To do this, he traveled on his boat. That's his name there. It's name there, HMS Beagle. He did this for five years, and he went all the way off to the Galapagos Islands, and he observed the species that lived there and just made observations about how they lived, how they interacted with their environment, some of the similarities he would have seen between them, and then he did this to come up with his theory of evolution. Uh, the Origin of Species was a publication made back in the day that kind of talked about this theory, but it was and it was a joint publication with another person there named Alfred Russell Wallace, who had some other ideas that helped contribute to the overall idea. But Darwin tends to be the more well known of the two. Okay. So the theory itself, it's essentially the widely held notion that all life uh, is related in some shape or form, and they've descended from a common ancestor. Okay. And so over time, uh, as a new generation of species is uh, born, they essentially have traits from the parents, but sometimes there's some modification that happens. Very, very minor modifications that happen over time where you get where you would have started with something a little bit more simplistic and you eventually made it to more complex creatures that we know and are aware of today. Basically though what happens is that over time there's these random genetic mutations that happen within the code. And if you remember back to the genetics unit you know, when we looked at the DNA, you know, typically mutations are quite rare as the human or as all organisms are pretty good at correcting them but it can happen, right? And if that does happen, that may change the structure of the proteins that are being made. Remember, DNA is there to serve as a, basically a blueprint to make proteins. Proteins carry out pretty much all the functions in your human body, whether it's even just a structural function or it actually does something like it's part of the immune system or it's producing an enzyme to help with digestion. They're all protein-based, essentially. Uh, and when there is a mutation in genetic code, it can slightly alter that protein, which may alter the actual protein functioning to begin with. Um, you know, we didn't really go too much into the, the, the chemistry of a protein or the, the structure of them. If you do take more biology, you'll definitely learn more about that. And it actually is quite helpful in terms of understanding how a protein functions, but <laughs> in general, the shape of a protein will dictate how it functions, okay? And these random mutations, these are known as natural selection, okay? So beneficial ones tend to be preserved if it does help with survival, okay? Uh, you know, we talked about the idea that some mutations can be bad and that may prevent them from being able to survive, and that definitely can happen. However, there are some mutations that and they've actually been good, and they do help this organism in one way or another. Even if it's a very minor way, that benefit can accumulate over time because it's one benefit to begin with, but then another generation is born and that benefit gets passed on, and then another generation that benefit's passed on. Over that time, maybe there's another mutation, which there's another benefit there. So they're, they're basically additive, and eventually, all of these things are going to accumulate, and over time, this, you know, time being millions of years or thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, you get different organisms, not just a slight variation of it. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's some roots and connection to it, but there's enough change that's accumulated over this long, long, long period of time where we get a, uh, a different species, okay? Now, for larger organisms like, say, us or whales or elephants, <clears throat> where the gestation period is several months, 
it's going to take longer for these changes to happen. But in something smaller, like bacteria, where it's replicating or reproducing every 20 minutes or half an hour, or, you know, if you look at species that have hundreds, like insects, where there's hundreds of uh, new, I guess, little big bugs being produced with every generation, there, it's more likely that you'll see mutations happening there, and then it can sometimes happen a little bit more quickly. But for something like us, where it takes a long time, it can, <clears throat> can take a little bit longer for us to really notice any changes there. Okay, so if we just look here, uh, just a couple examples. Um, you know, if we look at the whale, you know, obviously it's quite different from the rest of the things on here, but you know, these are if just some of the features that they do share. You know, we have the spinal cord in all of them. Okay, it's basically the same. Okay, we do see some modification at one point here where we get the the back hip joints and to to, to get other legs there, but um, so in some fossil records there, you'll notice that there's these little pieces here. Okay, They didn't really have much use for them, but there's slight, slight changes happening. And over time, they became bigger. Uh, they became more, I guess, more usable. Uh, and so they eventually may have evolved into the hind limbs that we are familiar with with a lot of and land animals. Okay. Uh, but again, there's still some other similarities that you may notice. Say, for example, right here, there's like the little shoulder blades. Okay, for a whale, it's obviously where the fins would have been connected. But for species that are a little bit higher up, that's where we would have our arms. Okay, um, and so you, you just there are certain trends that you do tend to see. Again, especially with mammals, uh, terrestrial ones in particular, uh, if you compare them. And their internal anatomy, as, as we would have done with our dissections, you, you actually notice there's quite a few similarities in terms of the, uh, the skeletal system, the organs in terms of how they're laid out, um, you know, and just the, the body cavities that we have. There's a lot of similarities there. And there's a lot of things that, you know, maybe on the outside look quite a bit different, obviously, but then when you actually get into the details on the inside, you start noticing a lot more, there's a lot more in common than there is kind of different. Um, you know, another example, and a more recent one that happened during the Industrial Revolution is these moths here. Okay, you'll notice you got that white one with some black spots, and you got this darker one that's mostly, you know, a black color. Uh, and part of this happened because during the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot more soot being produced and a lot more soot building up on trees, and so they became a little bit more darker, and a lot of times, Moths like to hang out, hang out on the bark itself, kind of camouflage, um, and you know they're trying to get away from birds. And when the bark was a little whiter with more black flecks throughout them, these white ones would have camouflaged a lot better inside on them. But as the soot kind of developed on the tree bark, uh, the darker ones ended up surviving more. And so, due to a possible genetic mutation, instead of developing just black spots and you know the body was mostly white more and more of the black spots were being produced until basically the entire thing was a dark gray black moth because this would help them survive the ones that were this color right here they would have camouflaged better while these guys would have been picked off by birds they would have been eaten and so these ones would continue to reproduce uh, they would produce probably more of the ones with the black spots until we get to or that were in, sorry that were entirely black and these spotted ones were having a harder time surviving therefore they're not reproducing as much and they slowly kind of died out as the darker one was more successful right. now the theory behind evolution uh, essentially builds off the premise of natural selection. Again, you've probably heard of this at some point, but what this is, is, is it's the act to preserve and accumulate minor advantages in genetic mutations, advantageous genetic mutations. So again, like I said, mutations, they can happen, albeit quite rarely, but some are bad, some are good, some, you know, there's the silent ones where they make literally no change whatsoever. Exact same thing is still being produced, okay? Um, and 
with natural selection, the good ones that do happen, again, however minor they may be, they're preserved, they're passed on, but again, over time you accumulate more and more and more until you become something slightly different. Okay? Now this, again, it's not like this is happening like one day all of a sudden you know, a new species is born to a, you know to so the parents. Okay, it's just oh no, there's a genetic mutation. We have a new species altogether. It takes a long time for this to happen. I mean, again, the the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and some of the early species showed up about three and a half billion years old. Um, and so there's a, a lot of time had to have passed for a lot of these things to have happened. Okay, if you just look at uh, some of the human species, okay, we have Homo sapiens, that's us there, and then we, you've probably heard of Neanderthals right here, uh, but you may have also heard of Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and then maybe not so much about the things before that, the Australopithecus, and uh, anything beyond that. But just looking at the skull shape, and if you notice that there's, it is a little bit blurry, but there's some numbers there indicating the volume. So that would have been how much space is inside this little brain, or this skull here for the brain itself. It got larger and larger over time, though actually, yeah, skulls, you know, you can't see it because my picture's in the way, but they actually had a larger space there, um, which is actually kind of interesting. They may have actually had bigger brains, but then why is it that they, uh, they kind of, they didn't really make it, whereas our species kind of dominated and made it on. So it's interesting to see, to look at what happened there. It's, it's hard to say. Uh, but again, it's not as if Homo habilis here just kind of had a baby and had a much bigger skull. And then, you know, a new species of human would have come from that. Okay, it would have been a gradual change that maybe it got slightly larger over time, you know, maybe a few volume units at a time. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the ones that had the bigger skull maybe had a bigger brain. And with a bigger bigger brain, they had certain advantages that allowed them to survive over longer periods of time. And so that would have just continued on and on. Right? So again, the idea here is that it does take a lot of time for this to happen. It's not just a one generation thing or two generations. It's several hundreds of generations for for these to adapt and change and become something different. Okay. Um, you know, who knows? In 100,000 100, years time, our species also may look quite a bit different too. But again, it's not like there'll be one slight change that happens within our species and then that just branches off into something different altogether. Okay. Again, they accumulate over time and as different, you have to think too, within the human population, there may be one mutation that happens between one set of parents and that offspring. Another mutation can happen between another parent and their offspring. And then if you then take those two that have the new mutations and breed those, you know, maybe they come together, maybe that leads to an entirely different thing too. It's, it's so hard to predict and to tell exactly what will happen. Um, that being said, it's not as if also Homo erectus showed up and then all the Homo habilis died out right away. Okay, It would have been a, a gradual thing that would have happened there too. Once that species came about, you know, they would have uh, probably cohabited the planet in the area that they were in. But again, because it was better adapted to its surroundings, it would have helped it survive. And survival essentially in this case means that you live long enough to reproduce, to carry out or to carry on your genetics and produce a new generation to live on afterwards. Um, because of the differences and the advantages that have accumulated between Homo erectus and Homo habilis, they would have had a, probably maybe an easier time surviving. Um, and again, over time and not like an overnight kind of thing, they were just better able to compete in their surroundings. They were better able to compete for resources and then they just kind of lived on where Homo habilis struggled maybe a little bit more and eventually they died out. 
Same would have happened between Neanderthals, uh, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Okay, Homo sapiens probably would have come from these at some point, but again, because of the adaptations they accumulated over time, they were better adapted to their environment, and so they were able to pass on their genetics a little bit more easy than the other species. So it's not as if you know one species shows up and the other is just gone from there. Okay, it's a gradual change, and again, certain species that live on Earth now, they're still around, okay? You know, if you, crocodiles, there were some that have been around for, you know, close to a million years. Other larger species of crocodile may have come out from there as well, but some of those original ones are still around. I mean, deep sea fish too, um, you know, some of the older ones still exist. Some of their uh, descendants coexisting at the exact same time. In a 10,000 years from now, maybe that original ancestor is gone and maybe the current descendants also change too uh, to generate new things as well. So some of the evidence for evolution, um, just to overview, okay, one of the biggest things obviously is that evolution encompasses descent and adaptation. Again, when a new offspring is born, it has all of genetic, genetic code from the parents, but there may have been slight changes in that but it's also a different combination of genes and when you mix them you may get different uh, different things popping up and so certain times they can adapt better than sometimes their parents could have and that may lead to further changes but with common descent some of the key things is that for one all organisms are composed of cells cells very similar structure across different species even between us bacteria um, you know, fungi or plant cells or anything like that. Yes, there are going to be some structural differences within our cells, and they lead to larger differences. Uh, but at the, same, at the end of the day, in terms of the actual things that go into a cell and how they're actually built, there are quite a few similarities. Okay, uh, in either case, they are getting energy and chemicals from the environment. They all have to be able to reproduce. Have to be able to respond to their environment you know, when something happens they need to make a change or adapt or something something has to happen and doing so may lead to things to evolve they change over time to get more adapted and so on and so forth okay now as i mentioned before the earth is four and a half billion years old uh the first prokaryotes you know so bacteria and stuff like that they came up about three and a half billion years ago and the eukaryotes which we're technically considered eukaryote. Remember, these are things that have a nucleus. Um, they would have been probably about 2.1 billion years ago. I mean, these are estimates. It's obviously, you know, we could be off by millions of years here. But the whole multicellularity thing, uh, where they are actually joining together into more complex organisms, maybe about 700 or so million years ago. So that means, you know, a lot of the evolution that we've seen over time has been in the last 20% of this planet's life. <laughs> um, you know, because again, life life's a complicated thing. All these things are trying to survive. They're just figuring things out too. And so, you know, what works and what doesn't work, that takes time to figure out. Um, so this may have started out a little bit slower, but it seems to have progressed at a much faster rate now that we've, I guess, become more efficient at life, I guess. Okay. So some other piece of evidence, there's fossil evidence, so um, harder body parts like the skull, the bones, those things can be preserved. You know, if, if they settle in, in the, the ground over time, sediments build up over that, and then you get layers, and then they get further pressed down, uh, and then we get different layers representing different time periods. And the further down you go, the older it is. The ones up, up higher are technically younger in a sense. Okay, and then when you compare them, you again, like we kind of looked at with the whale and all those other things, you do see similarities between them. Okay, and you do see gradual changes to happenings when you look at them. Um, there's also sometimes these transitional fossils, which are quite significant. Uh, there's certain organs where it's it's kind of in between. You know, it, it's not quite the original ancestor. It's not quite the descendant. It's kind of like it's making its way towards that. And so they're kind of like links between certain species. 
Uh, another thing is geological time scale. So again, there's a number of different eras, and this kind of goes along with the, the fossil evidence like I was mentioning, um, but there's diff different eras. And when you are looking at the fossils, you can kind of figure out when they would have lived based upon how deep you get them. But also more recently, there's that there's something called carbon dating, where you can see how much of the original carbon has decayed into a different form. And the percentage of the carbon that you have uh, would indicate how old it would be. It's more complicated than that, but I don't really want to get into it with this little video here. I mean, you can learn more about it if you do continue with it, but essentially you're analyzing the carbon sample and there's a ratio between different carbon atoms or different carbon isotopes, if you're using chem, and that ratio kind of dictates the age of it. Okay, so again, if we look at the fossils here, you know, again, you notice certain things that are being preserved, you know, there's the skull and there's certain other features. Uh, you know, if you look at this thing here, you got the rib cage, you have its spine, you see the, 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 the different limbs. Okay, and then again, you can compare these to other ones just to kind of see some patterns and see how they might be related. And this, this would have been what was used for a while. Uh, genetic material, or genetic information, that's more recent, but that's also been very helpful in determining these things. Uh, another bit of evidence is biogeographical evidence. And so this is studying the distribution of plants and animals in different types of environments. So again, we have like mountainous areas. So you have desert areas, you have, you know, open fields, like plains, and, or you have forests. And each of the species that live in those regions are quite distinct from the other regions. But if you compare mountain region to mountain region, or a forest and you know, a forest on another side of the world, you do see some similarities between the organisms that would have lived there, okay? You know, for example, uh, desert species, okay? Deserts tend to have very little water, and the organisms there have actually adapted to that. They've made changes. Um, certain, certain genetic changes would have helped them survive. So, for example, certain desert animals, their kidneys are much, much, much more efficient at conserving water. Okay, they're a lot more efficient at drawing out the water that is in the urine that would have been formed and then just removing the waste stuff. And that's obviously advantageous to those animals because there's not a lot of water that they come across now and again. Uh, and so they have to be able to conserve that for as long as possible. Water is essential to life. And so they have those advantages. So the biogeographical evidence just kind of shows how species would adapt to their environment and certain adaptations, which are beneficial, allow for longer periods of survival or better able to reproduce. And those advantages are passed on to their offspring. Okay. Uh, it also kind of plays on with the whole idea of continental drift. Okay. Again, millions and millions of years ago, the continents would have been much closer together and possibly even one giant one. And just as the Earth kind of shifted, they kind of split up further and further apart. And the interesting part with that is that sometimes you will find fossils that don't typically belong to that biogeographical region. You know, it wouldn't make sense for something like that to have survived there. Uh, but also it's just interesting to see how that even though they were separated, they kind of adapted to their environment no less. Okay? So it's, again, playing with the idea that certain adaptations are beneficial, they help you survive, and those ones get passed down. Uh, the last little bit that we'll look at is the anatomical evidence. So again, there's anatomical similarities between similar species. Okay, uh, you, so you have different things like the homologous homologous structures, right? And so these tend to have the same function and the same basic structure, indicating that there would have been a common ancestor. So if you look at a human's arm right, and the fin of a whale, uh, there's some similarities in terms of the actual layout. You know, they have the same type of bone. The structure of the bone itself, quite a bit different. We have much, much longer bone um, right here in our arm and so on. But the types of bones and the quantity of bone and the actual placement of them is quite similar uh, to ours in their fin. There's also the analogous structures, which means they have the same basic function but different origins. 
So wings, for example, the wing of a bird is quite different from the wing of a bat, or the wing of a bee is quite different from that of a bird as well. So they have the same function, but again, they're adapting to their surroundings and what they need to do. And so there's similarities, even though there's anatomical differences in terms of how it's built or how it was made. And then there's also, which is quite interesting, is the vestigial structures. Okay, So these are anatomical structures that are totally functional and have a purpose in one species, uh, but it's either reduced or just completely non-functional in another. Okay? And so what that means is, you know, we, there's some leftover pieces of a structure that essentially do nothing in, the, in an organism. But if you look at an ancestor or even something that's very closely related and still living, sometimes they also have that same structure. But to them, and based upon how they live, it still actually has a purpose. Okay, for example, we have a tailbone, but we have no tail, and we don't need it. We're not, I mean, it'd be cool, because then you can climb trees a lot easier and help you with balancing when you're running and stuff. But, you know, we're, we're mostly land-based. We don't typically live in trees too much. We're, we live on the land, and we don't, you know, maybe some disagree. We don't need a tail. It, again, it'd be cool, but it wasn't key to our survival kind of thing. Uh, other things, you know, the appendix. Appendix in us, we, do, we don't really know what it does. It doesn't really do anything aside from potentially burst and cause you a lot of pain and need to get removed surgically. It's there. And other mammals, uh, they, they do actually still have a function. Okay? And so another thing, too, is if you look, if, if you remember when we looked at the embryos of different species during the, the biodiversity unit, there's quite a bit of similarities in the very, very, very early developmental stages. And we're talking about just, you know, once it's fertilized and uh, we're just beginning our development cycle in the first few days. Okay, there's there's quite a few similarities between these species there. So again, that just kind of helps contribute to the evidence for evolution. So that's basically all uh, there is for the evidence of evolution and just a basic introduction to the idea of evolution that ended up being a little bit longer. Like I said, it's it's very interesting to talk about. It's interesting to kind of look at the different ideas and it's by no means a perfect theory. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're still yet trying to figure out. And there's also the, the whole, like I said, there's the DNA evidence that we need to start factoring in. Um, because that has opened up a whole new world in terms of analyzing the different species and how they're related. Um, but it's, I mean, it's still very interesting to kind of look at these ideas. And there's definitely a lot more that we could talk about uh, and more that you could learn about within this. But for the scope of this course, that's a little bit well beyond. And so uh, hopefully you found it somewhat interesting. And yeah, if you have questions, let me know. So hope that's hope you're all doing well and have a good day. Good one.